Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Welcome back to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we have begun a series on the world religions. In this series, we will discuss animism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. We will also wrap up this series with a discussion about what makes Christianity unique from all other before-mentioned world religions, as well as every other man-made religion and worldview. Today, we are continuing our conversation with George Walker. We're going to hear some riveting and inspiring accounts how God used George along with his wife Harriet, one other married couple, in reaching the Basodio people of Papua New Guinea. The Basodio people are an isolated tribe who had little contact from the outside world. After investing three years of learning the culture and language, providing a strong biblical foundation and a clear understanding of the grand narrative of Scripture, the gospel was clearly presented. That day, 70 of the Basodio people made professions of faith. By God's grace, there are now five churches and eight Basodio pastors. The entire New Testament and a large portion of the Old Testament scriptures have also been translated into the Basodio language. Please listen with me as I continue my conversation with George Walker. Well, in a recent Bible and Theology Matters podcast series that we had with a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Scott Keene, we discussed the grand narrative of Scripture. Ethnos 360, formerly known as New Tribes Mission, has become famous for telling the story of Scripture, or the grand narrative of Scripture. You and your wife had a big part in that. In light of what you discussed relating to syncretism, please explain to our listening audience why recounting the grand narrative or the story of Scripture became so essential to the work amongst indigenous people groups? Yes, Paul, that's a very, very good question. And let me just say this. Like, I think the first thing we want to do in light of just some of the characteristics that we discussed about animism and the characteristics thereof, that as we try to reach indigenous people groups for the Lord Jesus, first of all, let me just say this, that they are fellow human beings of equal value as image bearers, and they are always, always to be treated with dignity and respect, not condescended down to, not talked down to, not looked at, anything less than fellow image bearers, and the Lord is pursuing them through us. Kindness always, mercy always, and again, treating them like we'd like to be treated, with dignity and respect. That's the very thought that the Lord drove home to me when I very first got interior, deep interior. I mean, we were in the middle of absolute nowhere, Paul. No roads, no towns, no nothing. We were deep interior in the rainforest. And I remember the very first Basodio, I can see it like it was yesterday, like a picture in my mind. It was as though the Lord reminded me and said to me, George, you are looking at someone that's created in my image. And even though he does not know me yet, he is to be treated with dignity and respect. Hey, Paul, I'll never forget that. I just want to couch what we're about to say here, because the ministry, it is a very difficult and a lot of hard work, living ministry on your knees, a lot of prayer for God's wisdom. Because, man, we're over our heads. In fact, when, when are we not over our heads? It's like we constantly got scuba gear on. I mean, it's just like we're never going to be able to put it in cruise control. And so I think the first thing of why we want to minister in such a way we can tell the grand story of the Bible is because we need to acknowledge first and foremost is that they have a grand story. All people have a grand story. They have a meta narrative with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we want to exegete that story. We want to understand it. And it calls, I believe, for an incarnational approach where you literally go in, not parachuting in for quick visits, but you move into a neighborhood, whether it's in a village, whether it's in an urban sitting situation where you're trying to build genuine friendships. People are not projects. They're not lab rats. We're trying to move into a neighborhood, wherever that be, for the Lord Jesus and to genuinely care and love people like he did. 
And taking time to listen, taking time to learn their language, their culture, and the worldview assumptions that they hold about themselves, about God, about life, about purpose, about the afterlife, all these areas, about what is right and wrong, what is honorable and shameful, what is pure and defiled, all these things. My point is, we want to understand their grand story first before we begin to unfold and share with them the grand story of scripture. So number one, all people have a grand story. Number two, there are important features in any grand story, and I'm, I'm going to get a little technical here, but I want to try to make it clear. There are archetypes in every grand story, and by that I mean these are recurrent images or symbols that are pervasive in life. And as Leland Riken says so well, they are the forms that the imagination gravitates to when it organizes reality and human experience. All cultures have archetypes, symbols that they use to talk about and to think about reality. And they typically break down into ideal and unideal experiences. The Bible is pregnant with archetypes, both the ideal and the unideal experience. And Riken in his excellent book, Words of Delight, gives some examples because these archetypes fall into a vision of the world people want and the world they don't want. For example, in the world of nature, you see in the scriptures for the ideal experience in the story where God puts those there in purpose. From the world of nature, there's the spring and summer seasons, the sun, the moon, the stars, light and sunrise. But then archetypes for the unideal or negative experience would be the winter, the storm, the drought, darkness and night. If you take it from the world of plants, there's the green grass, the vineyard, the rose versus the unideal experience. There's the thorn, the thistles, weeds, chaff of grain. So you got these things that are in constant contrast from the world of sounds. There's singing and laughter and musical harmony versus weeping and wailing and discordant sounds. Okay, so in the story of the Bible, the Bible is putting these various archetypes either to woo you to God's perspective or to warn you, hey, you're going down the wrong path. These archetypes, okay, that's number one. All, all grand stories have them. Number two is we want to use archetypes, sorry for the technical thing here, but to create what is called foils. A foil is that which heightens or sets off an element in the story and highlights the contrast. That is a key factor in the way the Bible unfolds the story of the Bible, how God has done that, and God sets up foils all the time. Contrast, contrast, contrast. The greatest foil, of course, is God and Satan. But think as the story unfolds. Abel is a foil to Cain. Noah is a foil to the people of his time. Abraham is a foil to Lot. Joseph is a foil to his brother. King David is a foil to King Saul. You get in the book of Proverbs, the wise versus the foolish, the hard worker versus the lazy. It's everywhere. You can't get away from it. All cultures have archetypes and they have foils. I've done analysis and I've in my own culture, but I've done analysis and I've seen and I've helped other do a analysis in their cultures. All people groups have archetypes. All people groups in their grand stories have foils. And again, it speaks of the world they long for and the world they dread. They absolutely dread. I'll tell you who understands this is Hollywood. Hollywood knows how to leverage archetypes and create foils in all their movies. This is a key. So I believe that once you exegete the grand story, understanding the people's archetypes and their foils, then and only then are you ready to then proclaim into that grid because now you're able to unearth the worldview assumptions that have manifested these things. Now you're able to take your Bible teaching with the archetypes of Scripture and the foils that God has given all the way from Genesis to Revelation and like a laser beam, targeting your teaching into that opposing worldview grid. Again, doing it with love, doing it in mercy, doing it with respect, but man, declaring the truth. The biggest pushback that there is about this methodology I hear over and over is, well, George, that sounds like that's going to take time. Yeah, it is going to take time. But then the question comes, well, how much time is God taking with you? Yeah, like, 
tons of time. He who gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. And I would submit to you that taking time to understand people's heart language and culture and their worldview assumption is called loving people. Caring enough to love them enough to understand them well enough that when you present the treasure of the good news, it's being treated like a treasure. Now, you're speaking not theoretical or philosophical, but you spent three years learning the culture, learning the language. Absolutely. Amongst the Absolutely. And I've seen the impact of this methodology, and not only in our own work, but in multitude of works where people have taken the time to do this. And it pays huge dividends. And the beauty of it is your disciples go and do likewise. That's exactly how the Basodio Church was built. And matter of fact, some of the guys came up to us after being new believers and said, our relatives still up in the mountains who haven't heard yet, there's no way they're going to understand this unless they are taught as we are taught. And so it does take time and it doesn't have to take forever. I mean, it takes time to gain an intimate understanding. And I suppose if we didn't have the language barrier, it would have gone even faster. What I'm proposing here about exegeting the culture, understand the grand story, the archetype, and their foils so that you can teach the Bible intelligently into such a grid. I'm not saying guarantees converts, but what I am going to say, it guarantees clarity. So if people reject the gospel, they do it with eyes wide open. Very good. So you've talked about exegeting the culture, spending time knowing them, understanding their story, their grand narrative. You also spent 23 weeks teaching them, sometimes three hours a day, the grand narrative of Scripture. Tell us a little bit more about that and why, in regards to syncretism, why that is so important. Okay, well, after we did our three years of studying their unknown and unwritten language and culture, again, when we showed up there, it was an unknown, unwritten language. It wasn't like there was, you know, here's 12 CDs with the Basodia language on it. And by God's grace and God's mercy, and that's font 72, capitalized, (laughs) bold-faced, we were able to understand as we lived with them. And we did life with them. We wept with them. We laughed with them. We shared those together, hunting, fishing, this, that, the other. We in their houses, them in our houses. I mean, we were a community, neighbors. We loved one another. And so they knew they were going to hear this message. And we said, look, we're here because we have a very important message. They had no idea what it was, but they just knew it was important. Well, why else would you leave your country and come here? So when we told the leaders of the village the beginning there, we said, well, look, we noticed that when you tell important stories, you do it at night around the fires. And so we have an idea. How about if one night we teach this hut, and then the next night we teach this hut, and then the next night we teach that hut? We're just coming up with trying to brainstorm. And the elders looked at us and they said, hut the hut, hut the hut. Is this talk important or isn't it? Oh, we said, it's the most (laughs) important talk you're ever going to hear. And they said, well, well, none of this hut to hut stuff. You're going to teach the whole village at once. They said, let's let's just put the talk out under the sun. Full disclosure. Is their idea. So we said, okay. And then we said, well, man, that's fantastic. So we didn't want to press it. We said, well, well, how often would you guys like to meet? A couple of times a week, maybe? And they looked at us and they said, a couple of times a week? Is this talk important or isn't it? So we said, again, it's the most important message you're ever going to hear in your life. And they said, if it's that important, you will teach us every day of the week. That's what they said to us. So we said, well, wait, 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 wait. You know, you got to get food. I mean, it's not like there's Walmarts around. So they huddled, they broke away from us and they huddled together and they came back and they said, look, don't you worry about us getting food. We were getting food long before you ever got here. We know how to get food. They said, but you will teach us Monday through Friday. You will teach us five days a week. And so we started teaching them at their request five days a week. And so, Paul, we knew that the beginning of their story where their creator was the sun and the sun had an always wasness to it. They had creation story of where man came from. So they had all these stories and where death came from. So everywhere the Bible, like just even take the first three chapters of Genesis, their whole meta narrative, the beginning and how that unfolded and what they believed about the afterlife and so on and so forth, it was countering the Bible every step of the way. So we needed to know What were the archetypes that we could leverage and what are the foils within their own system? And then take the truth of the Bible and begin to glorify God, setting the beginning of a whole new story, bringing their worldview to tension, trusting not our skill in teaching, but trusting the spirit of God to turn light bulbs on, but teaching patiently 
Paul, we took two weeks in Genesis 1 and 2 alone. And why was that so important? We took creation to brag and boast on God. It wasn't just, you know, data transfer, like pull the head out and dump in the information. But we took time to glorify God in every day of creation. And we had more of a village conversation with them. As we sat on the hillside, it wasn't just a sermon where we were in some building and they were listening to a lecture. And we styled it after their village courts. So it was very interactive. The format was very natural and indigenous to their style of communicating about important matters. There was time for Q&A and all that. We had props. Like when we talked about the different vegetables, we we knew the vegetables they loved. We knew how they talked about it. And well, who gave that to you? Where do you think that came from? And so on and so forth. Well, the more that that unfolded, God became this unbelievably good, awesome, loving God that was just uncontainable. They would even use curse words like, like what, you know, they are so overwhelmed by this God of the Bible in a good way. And you would contrast to where, it to the God that they... Yes, know. absolutely. And their spirit world began to dwarf in the presence of this God of the Bible. He was off the charts. And it was through creation that the Lord got his foot into the door of their hearts. And then when they were heard, because the neighboring tribes downriver used to call the Basodios wild animals, jungle pigs. They saw themselves at the bottom of the totem pole, so to speak. Well, when they heard that they were created in his image with honor, with glory, with nobility, and with dignity, men and women, both equal, equal. When they heard that and that he created them to know him, and they would say, well, we don't know him. That's why he sent us here so that you can know him. It just was like this constant longing to know more and more and more. And knowing the origin of death that they had and where that came from. And then when they heard in Genesis 3 how Satan had deceived man, now not only an enemy of God, but an enemy of man, the fall and all of that. I mean, Paul, they were in the story. They weren't just hearing about the story. For example, I've been out in the garden. You know, when we're not teaching, we're still out and about. So I'm out in the garden with him, and here's a guy chopping down a tree, making a garden, and he's literally saying, Adam, oh, Adam, what were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? So they were in the story. Mm. The kinds of sins that we found amongst the Basodives, and again, this is not talking down because it was in, come on, well, where would we be without the Lord Jesus, right. please? But it was just like Romans 1 said, you are going to find them. And yet that's the very ones God's pursuing, the very ones he's pursuing. We had done a survey of the men. There was only four men who had not murdered someone in their lifetime. They were not just sitting under coconut trees waiting to hear Bible stories. And it's not like Discovery Channel would have you believe that, you know, these guys are one with nature. Mm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Go live with them for 20 years and see what it's like. So they've killed people within their own people group or other people Both. Groups, huh? Both. And so the building of that meta narrative and the taking time where they understand sin, the promise redeemer in Genesis 3.15, and then all the redemptive analogies, the God-given redemptive analogies Man, Paul, I know it takes time, but man, the Abrahamic covenant, understanding Isaac being offered up, then coming to the law, the tabernacle, and the redemptive analogy of the tabernacle, and all that that meant, the Passover. And then when Christ finally comes, man, the Basodias are not scratching their heads. Wait, what? What was that? Passover? What's that? None of that. And then the book of Acts, which sets the foundation for the epistles. We took four months teaching the book of Acts as an overview. When we came out the other side, the apostle Paul, is a hero. We go to Romans. He has the Basudio's undivided attention. This one that and so, killed and persecuted people becomes the yes, to share exactly. The gospel. And I saw the transformation. They could with that, couldn't they? Absolutely. And then when you get into, let's say, for example, okay, Romans four, where Paul makes the argumentation, Abraham was he justified by faith before circumcision or afterwards? The Basudios know the story. They already know what the answer is to that. And then so when people say. Well, George, that sounds okay, but man, that sounds like that's going to take time. Well, it depends if you want converts or if you want maturity. The Lord has called us to make disciples, not just converts. And sometimes I think they're that's not a, even really converts because they really don't understand what they're believing. Exactly. They've just raised their hands as an access to power. That is so, so unbelievably true. And 
is I bring in testimony after testimony from insiders from the host society of different countries that I visited that would say that very thing. Man, didn't understand. Here's one example that a brother in India told me. I'm over there teaching in a four-year residential training center. These guys mean business. These dear brothers and sisters leave their residence and come to this training center. Some of them leave home for a year at a time before they go back and then they keep coming. Four-year residential training center. And so I'm talking about how do we learn another culture and worldview? What's involved in all of that? And why are we doing it? Animism everywhere in India. And again, no disrespect, just declaring a fact, it is everywhere. And so this one brother, as we're in the middle of this course on animism, he raises his hand and he says, Mr. Walker, no disrespect intended, but it was a person from your country. And he named uh, where he was from in India, came to my village and on day one, through an interpreter, proclaimed the gospel. On day two, baptized the so-called believers. On day three, appointed pastors. On day four, left. Paul, with tears in his eyes, could hardly get the words out. And he's saying this publicly. And he says, Mr. Walker, syncretism is absolutely running wild in my home village. It's not hard to follow the breadcrumbs and why that would be. So I have two questions I want to ask about. First of all, so you spent... 23 weeks teaching the storyline of scripture, all of these very important yes. narratives in scripture before you preach the gospel. Is that correct? Right. We were laying the foundations for the clarity of the gospel, but right. we are also thinking that we're setting stories in place that are going to help them as new believers and developing and maturing believers. You know, someone might say, well, what about during those 23 weeks if someone would die? I'm sure you get that Yes, we had that question, and that's a fair question. And we would truncate the teaching in that case. We personally didn't have that. We're not trying to drag it out. There's nothing special about a certain number of lessons. But the gospel presupposes intelligibility of communication. And so, man, you've got to at least have the basics in there because, Paul, personally, I don't believe in anything like, uh, and I know you're not saying this, of course, but I know some that some people I listen to, it's almost like pixie dust theology, where you just sprinkle the gospel over people and somehow they have this ability to understand what you're saying. Language is language. Culture is culture. Worldview assumptions are worldview assumptions. The Bible itself would say, unless you make a distinction in the notes, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, whether you're playing the flute or a harp, how will anyone know what you're playing? And same it is with you. Unless you speak in words easy to be understood, you're going to be speaking into the air. And so, man, that's why we're trying to work at the heart language. But again, if someone is ill, you're truncating the message and trying to get to them as soon and trusting God in that situation. But the Psalms does say, and I, and this is the hope I took with the episodios, those who know your name will trust in you because you have never forsaken those who seek you. I believe that's from Psalm 9. You've never forsaken those who seek you. And the episodios were seeking them as they were hearing truth. They were responding. And I don't believe God was going to cut them down in the midst of the chase or of the response. And he didn't. As it relates to the fertile soil in parts of Africa to, say, the charismatic movement, do you see some of that related to animism and the spirit world and, and the lack of missionaries giving a strong, solid biblical foundation? Have you been yes. to Africa and seen the extremes that takes place there? And a lot of it is a power control as well in the spirits. Well, exactly. And I believe that versions of Christianity— go and they try to proclaim the gospel, not being aware, not being of the predisposition of the way the heart and mind of the animus is already oriented. That's the way they're going to engage the God of the Bible, that he too is to be one who is to be appeased, manipulated, appealed to, bribed, whatever the case may be. And again, as an access to power. Don't um, touch God's anointed, almost like a shaman. You don't touch. Oh yeah, God. no, there's that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd like to go back to one thought you mentioned a while back, um, but I didn't want to interrupt you on that thought. But you're talking about cultural anthropologists, and there's a book I'm sure you're familiar with, a famous book called The Last Days of Eden, and these cultural anthropologists that have this idea that indigenous people groups that are 
more isolated that that's still Eden. Like they're in a beautiful place in a beautiful world and leave them as they are. Don't bring our world into theirs and taint them, right? They're in the last Eden, last days of Eden. How would you respond to that? That is an unbelievably naive view of what's really going on in those cultures. I'll give you a perfect illustration. This would have been about six or seven years after we gave the gospel and our church was developing. We had British Broadcasting Company, yes, BBC, have some of their people come to Papua New Guinea And they said they were doing a documentary on modern missions. And so they had asked our headquarters in Florida if they could visit some of the works. And then we got asked if they could come into our work. Well, to be honest, immediately I had raised eyebrows in my own mind and heart. And so did my coworker, wait, BBC uh, doing a documentary on modern missions. Mm, Where's, okay, where's this going? They're not going to portray you very well. Yeah, they're not going to portray us very good. But at the time we thought, well, we were encouraged by our leadership to do so. And so we did. We had nothing to hide. And so they came in. We literally hosted them in our private homes there in the jungle. They were in there for a number of days doing interviews, filming this documentary, and so on and so forth. So one of the reporters wanted to interview some of the Basodio Christians. You know, she had to do it through us translating, obviously. And I said, look, we'll translate. You asked your question. We'll relay it to the Basodios in their language. They'll tell us, and then we'll turn what they say back into English so you can hear it. And we said, look, we give you our word. We will tell you exactly what they say. So she said, okay. So she starts with the questions. One of the questions was, now, are there things about your culture that you no longer do that you wish you could still do, but you don't because the missionaries are here? Okay, that's the question. So I said, okay. And I relayed that. And the believer sitting on my couch right there in the village, they turned and gave this incredulous look like, wait, what? (laughs) as only the Basodias could in their rhetorical sarcasm. Oh, it's good to be fearful all the time, is it? Oh, it's good to be sick all the time, is it? And they went with all this negative and they said, well, why would we want to go back to that? Living in a bubble of fear, they didn't say bubble, but living in fear. No, Jesus Christ coming to earth, dying and rising again for our salvation. That's what we want to pass on to our kids. And, you know, when I translated that back to her, she did the old eye roll, like, oh, yeah, sure. I'm sure that's what they said, you know. But, Paul, that was it. It was there for the taking. And it was like, I thought, ma'am, you have no idea, number one, who you're talking to in these Basodio Christians. You have no idea what their life was before they heard the gospel. You are living in a fantasy land if you think this is Eden or some pristine setting, like it's Disneyland. I've actually said that to some of the Basodios. Hey, do you realize there's people downriver? I say downriver because they're up at the headwaters. So everything is America, China, Australia, everything's downriver from them. I said, do you know what the guys downriver are saying? You should be left alone. You should be totally left alone. Nobody needs to come see you. Keep living like you are. Oh, let us go talk to them. (laughs) Who's saying that? Let us go talk to them. So sometimes I feel, yeah, let the insiders talk. I was reading the words of, in a response to that book, The Last Days of Eden, the words of an animist turned Christian. I was told this. This is what the cultural anthropologists say. Leave them the way they are. They're happy. They're in the last days of Eden. His response was similar to the ones you mentioned of the Basodios. Please don't listen to them. Nobody's that stupid. They must hate us. They must think we're animals. They don't want to be in fear, right? They need the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, amen. Amen. That's right. And the glory and the honor and the hope of eternal salvation that it brings. And, oh, man, the transformations we've Mm -hmm. seen in husband and wife relationships, parent-child relationships, neighbor-to-neighbor relationships. Our guys have had an influence in impacting four other people groups. Thank you for taking that message of the gospel, the whole story of Scripture from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21, right? Well, what are some organizations that are devoted to reaching indigenous people groups who are animists. How can our listeners learn more and partner maybe financially with such organizations? There are two main entities that train for this very purpose, and that would be Ethnos 360. You can look them up online and also Radius International. And of all the Mission agencies that are out there, and there are a lot of good ones, but as far as training to reach animistic people and really rock-solid training, those two would give you the most in-depth training that you're going to get anywhere. 
Ethnos 360 and Radius International, I highly, highly recommend. I've been involved with them both, and I know the quality of training you get, not only cross-cultural training, but also your walk with the Lord, your walk with one another, and so on. I can't recommend them highly enough. There's also a website, it's called Ministry Watch, and you can go on there, and they're basically as I understand it, a website, a Christian nonprofit that is trying to let people who would like to give and donate financial wherewithal to mission organizations or Bible translation organizations that are working with unreached people groups. So you can go to ministrywatch.com and they have, like, for example, you could look up the 50 largest mission agencies and Bible translation agencies, and they'll have their websites there, their purpose statements, their financial readings of the latest and their credibility and all that. It's an excellent, excellent resource for seeking that out. Ministry I'm with right now is Interact Ministry. We mostly work with First Nations people in Western Canada, Alaska, and Siberia, indigenous peoples there. So I just want to encourage our listeners, if you don't already, as a family, you can partner with another family that's taking the gospel to the ends of the earth to reach animistic people groups, indigenous peoples. What better way to train your children than to say, let's pray for this family, let's give to this work. Amen. For our listeners who may never go to an animistic people group, but have coworkers, neighbors, and or family members that have animistic tendencies, what is some advice you might give them as they seek to share the gospel with someone with a spiritual world view that is their spirits behind objects and events in their lives? Yeah, and again, I feel I would approach it the same way I would approach anyone in that regard, Paul. And again, I I keep going back to Proverbs 18, 13. He who gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. And so I would think if you have a relative or a coworker who may be animistic or have belief about spiritual entities and forces in the world, that you want to understand that and you want to understand that well. So I would say, man, take time to be a great listener. Slow on giving answers. Be one that listens well with the purpose of truly trying to understand that person well so that you are genuinely caring about them. And it does involve doing a lot more listening than talking and prayerful engagement with the Lord as you gain knowledge and understanding. I would say that in doing that, you're trying to understand who or what preoccupies their thoughts, sways their emotions, influences their choices, commands their affections and how they spend their time. And I would even say, man, as you listen to their story and their life journey, as it were, try to listen for some defining moments that they speak of. Because often those defining moments, maybe it was the death of a loved one or some trauma like a car accident or they lost their job or some major thing that happened. Those things are like deep worldview shapers. And they can impact someone's view of themselves, their view of God, their view of right and wrong, their view of life's purpose, all those kinds of things. And those stories, I believe, if you listen and listen well, you can begin to discern how they've been impacted by those events. And again, and that's part of, I believe, treating them with dignity and respect so that when you share the gospel and try to speak into their hearts knowing they believe there's this spiritual force, this spiritual entity, or or that happened because of some bad alignment of some kind of spiritual force or whatever the case might be, I think that it would even lead you as to how you might teach the Bible to them and what stories you might pick out of the overall story of the Bible. As you gain an insight as to where they're really coming from, God will guide you, got total confidence in the Lord to guide you as to be way more customize gospel sharing to this particular person or persons. God's put those people in your life on purpose and has got you in their circle of influence. Whatever is preoccupying their thoughts, their choices, their affections, their allegiance, what they're yielding to, those are the things I believe that the Lord gives you insight to where people's hearts, where their treasures might really be. And then prayerfully, again, just gently and kindly and respectfully sharing the good news. 
So we need to build bridges and look for opportunities in the life of those individuals, not just a one-size-fits-all gospel. Yeah, not at all. Well, for someone listening today that wants to do more than just partner financially with Indigenous people groups, maybe the Lord's calling them to serve amongst an Indigenous people group. Where can they get more training and consider partnering with an organization to do that? The two main entities, I would say, would be Ethnos 360 and Radius International. In my opinion, that's the best training you're going to get. It takes time to go through the training, and it's very demanding and stuff. But let me just say this. One thing I've become fully persuaded of is that God absolute delights in using the weak and the foolish. Don't let yourself be talked out of it. You feel the weight of your not enoughness. Well, I could never do this. I could never do that. Yeah, man, just just trust the Lord. After we finished all our training with, at the time we were with New Tribes Mission, which changed its name to Ethnos 360, we did our Bible school, our missiological training, our language training. We had all that training. And now we're from New Jersey, my wife and I. We headed back for a time of trying to raise support before we went to the field. But as we got back home, I honestly started reflecting on, oh man, wait, our first term is going to be five years long. Man, going to be in the jungle somewhere. As I was there in New Jersey contemplating going to Papua New Guinea, man, I just started having all these wild imaginations. Man, what if I get deep interior and I break my leg, then what? What if I get some sickness like malaria and, and I die in the middle of the jungle because I couldn't get access to medical help? What, what if they eat me? I even thought, I thought all these wild thoughts. Paul, I was having panic attacks. I had all this fear bubbling up day after day, week after week. Fear, worry, fear, bubbling, 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 bubbling. I never told anyone, including my wife. In the meantime, my wife becomes pregnant with our first child. And now time is going on. Time is going on. Four months pregnant, five months pregnant, six months pregnant, seven months pregnant. We get our tickets and visas. We bought our tickets to go to the field. And finally, like a pressure cooker, the lid comes off and I couldn't take it anymore, burying all this fear. And I say to my wife, sweetie, I, I said, I, I've got to talk. Well, what's, what, what's, what's the matter? I said, sweetie, I'm, I'm afraid to go to the field. You're what? We're leaving in two weeks. What are you talking about? We got our tickets in hand. We got our visas. She's seven months pregnant. I said, sweetie, please wait. Wait, I just need some more time. Uh, This is going to be our first kid. I don't even know. I don't even know if I'm going to be a good dad. I I need another six months. No, no, no. I need need another year. Paul, fear, 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 just bubbling over. My wife was not like that at all. So it was like, man, it's a fine time now. Okay, cut the story short. Out of pride, I keep going forward. So we get to the Philadelphia airport to take off to Papua New Guinea, and we're going for five years. I am a nervous wreck. Fear has gripped me like never before. This was during the days when people could still come to the gate to see you. So the church sends a whole busload of people to see us off. Her parents, my parents, aunts, uncles, siblings, cows, dogs, chickens, everybody's there to see us off. This huge crowd around us. My mom comes up to me. Again, we're going away for five years. Just grabs me, just weeping, 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 weeping. And then she said, George, if there's there's anything I've ever done and I for against you and I've never asked your forgiveness, please forgive me now. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? What am I going to the gallows? I'm not coming back. Why are you saying that? I'm thinking to myself. My dad comes up again, just weeping, weeping, weeping. And he just kept saying over and over, it isn't fair. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. And I kept thinking to myself, yeah, you preach it. I will turn the pages. So, I mean, just my emotions are clawed to shreds. The only one that knows that I'm terrified to go to the field is my wife, who's seven months pregnant. Well, the church puts their hands around us and they sing this song with us in the middle there at the gate before we board the plane. God be with you till we meet again. So they start singing this song and I'm thinking, God be with you till you meet again. Easy for you to sing. You're going back home home to your homes. I'm going to the other side of planet Earth, and who knows what's going to happen. In the meantime, the lady who's at the gate, she says, I'm sorry, you're the last ones. You have got to get on that plane. So we get on the plane. Now we're going to go Philadelphia, LA, two-hour layover, and then on to Honolulu. We were island hopping our way down to New Guinea because my wife's pregnant. And so we're flying across the United States, 
All the way over from Philadelphia to LA, I kept saying over and over to my dear wife, sweetie, what are we doing? Sweetie, what are we doing? I'm not ready for this. What are we doing? I am not ready, sweetie. And I'm talking to her like that. By the time we get to LA, I've got her in, you know, so discouraged. You know, she needs a rock to lean on and she's got a marshmallow for her husband. We get to LA and she said, will you please make up our mind? Are we going to the field or aren't we? I said, all right, give me a minute. And so there were pay phones over up against the wall and I kept pacing back and forth, back and forth. And then I thought, no, I'm done. This is it. I am turning back. This is it. I'm done here. So I went over to her and I said, do you see the phones over there? She said, yeah, I see them. I said, I'm calling pastor right now and telling pastor, pastor, cat's out of the bag. The jig is up. George Walker is a coward. He's a fake and a phony and I'm coming home. So my wife says, well, go right ahead and make the phone call. So I said, all right, I need to find flights back to Philadelphia first. So I walked over to the United Airlines ticket counter and I said, excuse me, ma'am, could you help me? Oh, well, well, sure. I'd be glad to help you. What could I do for you? I said, I need flights back to Philadelphia. She said, okay, let me, let me see what I can do for you. Paul was right there filled with fear. I was at the end of my tether. You talk about feeling of your not enoughness. That was me. And yet the Lord drew alongside of me. It was almost like Martha, Martha, you know, George, George, you're worried about so many things, but only one thing is needful. Trust me, George, trust me. I've called you to this. I'm not going to pull the rug out. For you. I want you to keep walking forward. Trust me. Paul, I can't explain it. But in the midst of the fear, there was this mingling of assurance, this peace, this confidence. Did the fear dissipate? No, it didn't. The fear was there. And yet at the same time, it was co-mingled with assurance. Psalm 56, I think, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. So then I told the lady at the United ticket counter, no, I'm sorry, I, I don't need that now. So I went back to Harry and I said, no, we're going. All right, so we're going. So we get on the plane, we go all the way over. I'm telling you the story because it's the truth, that if it wasn't for God's grace, I would have never, ever, ever got to Papua New Guinea and the Basodio people would have never heard the gospel from these two lips if it wasn't for his unbelievable grace. And I told the Basodio this very story and I told my home church this very story. We got to the field and several weeks later, we get a cassette tape that was air mailed to us and the pastor in the cassette tape said in part, George and Harriet, what a thrill it was to see you off at the Philadelphia airport with your face set of flint to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus to the four corners of the earth. And I'm thinking, face set of flint? Yeah, to get back home is where my face was set. So I told the church, no, that's not true. This is what happened. This is what was in my heart. I was weak. I was fearful. But the Lord met me in the midst of my fear, in the midst of of my worry in the midst of my not enoughness. I told the Basodios the story. They couldn't get over it. They even said, you you thought we were going to eat you. <laughs> they said, that, that's not us. That, that's not us. That's those guys over there that do that. But anyway, I mean, God's unbelievable grace and enabling in the midst of weakness, he delights in it. So I say all that, the story, sorry, it took a little time, but I want people to know, man, don't talk yourself out of it give God a chance to work in and through your life. And maybe you have, you know, in air quotes, your own Philadelphia airport experience, so to speak, that you're up against, whatever that might be, trust God to keep walking forward and whatever he has for you. You're a part of the body of Christ and he has a specific purpose for you. And it includes getting the gospel to others. Well, thank you for sharing that story. I can't imagine being in those shoes of yours. You know, I, I was a missionary in the country of Hungary for 13 years and the people in Budapest, we lived out in a village, and the people in Budapest that were missionaries would always talk about us as the real, air quotes, real missionaries. But <laughs> right. We always think of you all at Ethnos 360 <laughs> and elsewhere as the real missionaries because of the- Well, I'll tell you what, there's, there's real missionaries everywhere, even here in the States for that matter. I mean, I don't know where it's easy to be one. I mean, sharing the gospel in this day, it is a battle no matter who you're sharing it with but the Lord wants it to go forward. We have to glorify the Lord Jesus. And there's still sheep that he's going to bring to himself. We get the honor and privilege of being a part of, pointing them to the good shepherd. That's right. Well, thank you, George, for taking so much of your time to- Thank you, Paul. This podcast, and I'm sure it'll be a blessing to many. I hope so. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. 
to learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. Visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.